Good morning and welcome to worship here with us at Christ the King. Whether you are joining us digitally or whether you are joining us on your television, whether you are joining us live or on replay, we are so thankful to have you as part of our worshiping community. A couple of announcements that we would like to lift up today. If you are watching this live and had considerations about coming to the 10 o'clock outdoor worship, you might want to rethink that plan. Because of today's uh, chilly temperatures and wind, we will not be having an outdoor worship service today. We do have a positive note about that, however. Our, um, our various committees in charge of making that decision have been working hard, and we hope to have indoor worship options coming your way very, very soon. So keep your eyes and ears open for more information about that. A very special announcement that we would like to make today this week, on Tuesday, this young lady began her career at Christ the King 30 years ago, this Tuesday. So be sure to drop a note of thanks to Amy Olson this week to let her know how grateful we are for her 30 years of service here at Christ the King, and we hope she stays well beyond that. So. Those are your welcome announcements for today, and now we will begin with our confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen.
our hearts. Created by you, let us live in your image. Created for you, let us act for your glory. Redeemed by you, let us give you what is yours. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, for King's kids today, I brought a little something with me. We recently had a birthday at my house. My um, number four kiddo, Teddy, turned eight this month, and he got this birthday card that I thought was perfect for King's kids today. So I'm gonna share it with you. It says, slinging some web your way. There we see Spider-Man there, and he's doing his web thing. But then, when we open it up, something happens. And I'm not sure how well you can see that at home, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. When I open the card up, it almost looks like the printers made a mistake because the lines aren't crisp and sharp and the words are a little bit blurry and hard to read. When I look at the Spider-Man on the front, I can see super easily all the lines and attention to detail, but when I open it up, it's blurry and kind of odd. It's hard to read, and I don't really like to look at it very much. It seems a little bit like it's out of focus, I guess. But, Here's the interesting part of this birthday card. Maybe you've had one like this before. This birthday card came with some super cool shades. So, when I put these super cool shades on and I look at the birthday card, oh my goodness, all of a sudden, I can read the words and it says, to wish you, fam, a webtastic birthday. And you know what the coolest part is? It looks like Spider-Man is like jumping off the page and flying right at me. The picture didn't change, but the way I see the picture has changed a little bit. Now my eyes haven't changed and this hasn't changed. What is different now than the first time I looked inside this card. Oh, the glasses. These glasses are different. And today, in our scripture reading, and today when you're listening to Pastor John talk, I think you're gonna hear a little bit more about this. And today I want you to think about how when we look at things with God glasses on, we look at them through the lens of love and the lens of justice. And the things we're looking at don't necessarily change, but the way we focus on them changes. And some things become more sharp to us. They become more focused to us. And some things seem to jump off at the page and grab our attention a little bit more when we use our God glasses to see, when we look through those lenses of love and justice. And that is pretty cool. So let us pray. Dear God, thank you for God glasses. Help us to look through your lenses of love and justice at all of the things around us. Help our vision to become more sharp because of your love and justice. And help us to better see those things that jump out at us because of your love and justice. In your name we pray. Amen. Reading from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, the 45th chapter. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, 
to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him, and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Beside me there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know, from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is no one beside me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make weal and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. Here ends the reading. As Deacon Billy Joe said, oftentimes in order to see God at work in the world, it is not required that we see something different from what others see, but to see as God sees means that we must often see the same thing differently. Let us pray. Father, for your grace that is indeed so amazing, we are thankful today. Help us to see and to understand that that grace and mercy and love come to us not only in so many wonderful ways, but for so many wonderful reasons. Open our eyes and hearts anew today, Father, that when we look at the world around us, we can see things the way that you see them, so that we can see things differently. Amen. So when you look, what do you see? When you look at the morning headlines day after day, at all that has and continues to happen in the world around us, what do you see there? Or when you look at the struggles or the difficulties or for some the absolute heartbreaking tragedies that have come to be a part of your lives, when you look at them, what do you see? Or when you look at old pictures of yourself like we did of Amy here just a few moments ago, when you look at old pictures of yourself from days and times gone by, what do you see? Or when you spend a few extra minutes in front of the mirror these days, looking carefully at the one who is looking back, what do you see? When you look, what do you see? It is the question that had puzzled and perplexed the people of Israel for nearly 60 years, all of which had been spent in exile in Babylon, having been captured by the dreaded king Nebuchadnezzar and his army. All during those 60 years, the prophets of God came and promised that they would be set free from their captivity and able to return to their homes. Over and over again, they repeated God's promises, fear not, I will help you. I will hold your right hand. I will lead you and guide you. I will turn the darkness before you into light. Remember not the former things. I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. And with each promise came a resurgence of hope, a hope so important to a people living in exile. But time and time again, the people were disappointed in what they saw because they were looking in the wrong place. Now Isaiah comes here in chapter 45 and declares that to them that Cyrus, king of Persia, will be the one to redeem them from their bondage in Babylon. When the Israelites looked at Cyrus, clearly they didn't see what God saw. 
Twice in these seven verses, Isaiah tells us that Cyrus doesn't know God. He was from Persia. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. He practiced the ancient pagan religion founded by Zarathustra. He was not of the house and lineage of David or of any house or of any lineage that would be acceptable to the Israelites for that matter. Yet God anointed him to be king, to lead God's people from their exile in Babylon back to the home that they had longed for for so long. God's actions in the world are not to be found only in separate sacred events, but in all the moments of human existence. The presence of God is not to be found where nothing else is present, but rather just the opposite. Anything that exists is filled with and points to the presence of God. God works in and through human instruments, both in this prophet who now speaks and in this king who now conquers. To see God at work in the world is not necessarily to see something different from what others see, but to see the same thing differently, through different glasses, if you will. To see God at work in the world today, we don't have to go looking for something different, but to look at many of the things that are going on around us and look at them differently to look at them the way God looked at Cyrus. Or the way he looked upon David after he had looked at all of the others of Jesse's sons. Or the way he looked at Zacchaeus. Or the way he looked at a young innocent girl by the name of Mary. Or the way he looked at a persecutor of the church named Saul. Faith instills in us the ability to see what cannot be seen. To see things differently demands a a discrimination between the manifest powers that, that, that would seduce us to idolatry and the implicit powers that is constantly summoning us to a life of faith. Israel wanted to see something Someone different, not Cyrus. He can't do it. He doesn't fit our understanding of the prophecies. He's not a Jew. He's not one of us. He's not a believer. He's a Persian, for goodness sake. He's a pagan. It just doesn't work for us, they said. They had their ideas. And in many ways, their ideas blinded them from what God wanted for them. They had their own opinions. They knew what they wanted. And they knew that Cyrus wasn't it. In their eyes, God could not work in or through this pagan Persian king. But to see God at work in the world, it is not required that we always see something and look for something different, but to see the same thing only differently. So what do we do when we, like Israel, see a growing chasm between promise and fulfillment in our own lives? Between what we have come to believe about and expect from a loving God and what we see being revealed in our lives around us? What do we do when we look in the mirror and see all of the changes that have taken place in our lives and the effect that they have had? What do we do when we look for answers and end up with being confronted with yet more questions? The author of Hebrews answered the question this way. When you look, keep your eyes fixed 
on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that is set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. When you aren't sure, look to Jesus. When your heart is heavy, look to Jesus. When you see the pain and the anguish that's not only a part of your lives but the lives of those you love so dearly and so desperately and that's all you can see then look to Jesus consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners so that you may not grow weary so that you may not lose heart when you look Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He's the one who has promised to be in the center of all that comes to be a part of our lives, in the midst of the challenges and the difficulties, but also in the midst of the joy that comes to be a part of life as well. For only when he is present will our joy and our lives be complete. Will we then see what we want to see? I don't know. I do know that Cyrus did indeed conquer Babylon in 539 BC and shortly thereafter issued an edict proclaiming and enabling the Jewish exiles to return to their homes in the land of promise. I do know that God worked out his plan of restoration and salvation for Israel, not necessarily in the way that the people of Israel wanted it done, but through a Persian pagan king named Cyrus. But I also know that I have been looking for years for answers to some of my own questions and for what I believe to be the promises of God to be fulfilled. And today, I continue to wait. It's easy to stand and say that to see the hand of God at work in the world, it's not required that we see different things, but that we simply see things differently. It is yet another task to live that way, day in and day out. It seems as though there are too many days, especially lately it seems, when so much of what we see seeks to destroy and deny that which we have been taught to believe is the truth about God's word, the truth about God's love and grace. So much of what we see does its best to sometimes deepen the darkness in a world that so desperately needs the light of Christ's love. Right now, in this very moment, so much of what we see and experience only adds to the pain. In a few moments, we'll receive, those of us who choose to receive it today, a small wafer and a thimble full of grape juice. And as Christians have done for centuries, we'll hear the words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all our sins. The way we've been doing communion for the last several weeks, months now, is with these little, these little things. Um, and uh, I, I'll be the first to admit that I, I look at them and quite frankly, I don't see um, Holy Communion as clearly as some might be able to. You know, they're the, they're the things where we peel off the top layer and, and eat this little wafer and then, and then, you know, kind of hold our breath and peel off the next thing and pray that it doesn't, you know, make a big purple stain on the front of our church. I, I, I have to tell you that when I think of Holy Communion, I think of a chalice of wine and a patent with either wafers or a loaf of bread on it. I think of 
a pastor who, or a deacon who, who stands there and is able to share this wonderful gift with God's people. Quite frankly, when I think of communion, I don't, I don't think of this. When you look at the waters of holy baptism and the bread and the grape juice of the Lord's Supper, there is little here that speaks of power and promise. And yet, it is the very presence of God in, with, and under the little piece of wafer under the cellophane and this little bit of grape juice within this little plastic cup. It is God's love poured out for each of us. So however you look at it today, as you look, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus so that you too may be able to see as God sees. Amen.
With confidence in God's grace and mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious God, you call us by name and invite us to share your good news. Send your Holy Spirit among preachers, missionaries, and evangelists. Give us, we give thanks for the witness of your servant Luke, the evangelist, whom the church commemorates today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of praise, the heavens and all creation declare your salvation. From the rising of the sun to its setting, may the whole universe show forth your goodness. Raise up devoted stewards of all that you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all, may your word of justice sound forth in every place. Restore divided nations and communities with reconciling truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of light, we pray for those living with pain, illness, isolation, grief, anger, or doubt. Join their voices in a new song, assuring them that you call them each by name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of truth, you show no partiality. May your spirit guide the work of justices, magistrates, court officials, and all vocations of the law, that your promise of restoration may be known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Living God, as you raise Jesus from the dead, so raise up those who have died among us. We give thanks for their witness, confident of your rescuing welcome for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Listen as we call on you, O God, and enfold in your loving arms all for whom we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. At this time, we prepare to receive our offering. And it is important that you know how incredibly grateful we are for the many, many ways that you have con continued to support us and our ministries here. Christ the King, whether that has been through online giving, the mailing of checks, your prayers and support, or whatever other ways that you have been able to share your gifts and talents with us. We are just wrapping up our pledge drive, and while it officially ended, I believe, this last Thursday, we want you to know that we're Lutheran, and we have lots of grace. So if you still have a pledge card at home, feel free to drop it by the office or put it in the mail, because we would be happy to have your pledge be part of our um, upcoming ministry year. Thank you for all that you do and continue to do, supporting the ministries of Christ the King and throughout our area.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with this rich food and drink and send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then in the same manner also after supper he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, All of you drink from it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you then, however, it is that you will be receiving communion today um, to um, uh, take the bread, and if you have one of these neat little cups, you can peel off the top layer, take the wafer, and receive the body of Christ given for you. And carefully peel off the next layer and receive the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of all your sins. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, his holy and his precious blood, strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
God sees. With grace, love, and mercy. Thanks be to God. Thank you.